Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of Mercy One Cancer Center and the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series. This series is brought to you in part by a grant from the Rosalie and Sherry Xline Ziegler Fund. So welcome. My guest tonight is Dr. Jessica Gorzalich. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, pretty good. Go, pretty good. Okay. And uh, uh, Jess is from Wisconsin and she has a PhD and we're going to learn more about her education, but she did her undergrad and graduate work at the University of Wisconsin. And she is currently a system professor of health promotion at the University of Iowa, where she is the director of the lab that looks at and does research on the relationship between physical activity physical activity and cancer survivorship. So right up our alley, Jess. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's nice to be with like-minded people. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Also, I, I just learned this evening that she did a postdoc at the National Cancer Institute in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And I uh, essentially did a postdoc there as well. It was my first um, position as a board certified radiation oncologist was at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. So Welcome. So tell us a little bit about uh, growing up and maybe um, when you first appreciated uh, physical activity as something that was a positive in your life. Yeah. So thanks again for having me here, Dr. Deming. It's really great to connect and to speak with everyone. Um, so I have a relationship with physical activity that goes back to my early years. Um, so when I was growing up, I had dreams of being a professional athlete. I loved playing basketball. Um, and you don't, you can't tell this from the zoom, but I'm about five, six on a good day. Um, <laughs> but I went, I went through puberty early and thought I was going to play post, you know, the center, the big person and my dad's five, six. So he saw, and as the tallest member of the family, he could see what was coming down the tracks. Um, so instead of, you know, dashing my dreams, uh, and sort of explaining why that wouldn't be feasible, he took me to the weight room. So my dad was influenced by the Arnold Schwarzenegger pumping iron era. Um, and he has been an exerciser all of his life. And I think his rationale was, you know, if my daughter can't be a six foot tall athlete, you know, she can be the strongest one in the position. Um, and I remember that first time walking into the gym uh, and it smelled like iron and sweat and yeah. it was a powerlifting gym. So these guys are yeah. like, yo, yeah. you know, yeah. and I like <laughs> shook the hand of the gym owner and like, I felt my bones like clap yeah. and I was hooked. I was like, this is the coolest place ever. Yeah. Like, and so from that point forward, you know, I found a uh, community in the gym. Uh, and despite the fact I was a you know chubby fifth grader, um, the guys were super kind and supportive and like very nurturing. And it was that focus and that mentality on growth, you know, sort of like you can't control a lot of things, but the things that you can control, you better do them well. Um, so that is where this whole started. To this day, I still lift with pretty good regularity. That's my main form of exercise. Um, but that interest kind of carried me through my educational path. I didn't think this is where I would be back then. Mm -hmm. And then in, in high school, what was your claim to fame in high school? Uh <laughs> the third in my class, I was not the valedictorian or the salutatorian. I was um, captain of the math league, uh, but um, I played on the basketball team, which was pretty cool. Um, and I always, always performed really well in the strength and conditioning domain. Um, mm -hmm. So I was your textbook, like mediocre athlete. You know, I took it very seriously, but you go back and you watch the film and it's like, why were my parents driving me? to all these tournaments, like there is no athleticism. Um, but I, I tried very hard to be fair. Um, yeah, it was again, a really supportive community, you know, sport informed a lot of the strength and conditioning piece and it's a different application for power lifter. Um, but it was, it was really fun and, you know, young, nothing hurt, you know, it was great back then. Yeah. You know, I, I went back to my high school in South Dakota for my 50 year high school reunion. Wow. And we, we had a tour of the high school and they've got a huge weight lifting. We had zero, zero weights. Uh, you know, the football play, no, nobody had any mm -hmm. weight training. And now, I mean, it looks like a, you know, like a university of Iowa weight 
training center probably not i <laughs> but compared Close. for this little town in south dakota and uh weight training has become huge and they have weight lifting also as a competitive sport in high school so um, when do you think that uh recognition that weight lifting or resistance training or whatever you know the preferred term that that, that was an important component of overall health yeah, that's this is one of my favorite questions to answer because it takes so I'm trained equal parts as like a behavioral scientist, exercise scientist, you know, doing the exercise studies, but I'm equally trained as an epidemiologist who relies on observational data. You folks have had Dr. Alpa Patel, who is one of my professional, you know, role models. Like you can do a lot between exercise interventions and and epidemiologic data. Um, and part of this, to respond to this answer, you have to go back and think of the history. So um, our obsession with health and fitness was very much raised in a cardiovascular lens. In the 1970s, we were very concerned with heart health, um, you know, the cholesterol of the, you know, eggs and all of that, you know, really concerned about heart disease as the killer. And now if we don't consider COVID, heart disease is a, a, the number one killer of Americans. But back then in the 1970s, um, and even before that, arguably, uh, strength training or muscle strengthening exercise or resistance training was reserved for athletes. You know, Jack Lane was a, was a weirdo and Arnold Schwarzenegger was an absolute, you know, monster alien. You know, like these people were one offs um, and that there was sort of this perception that that weightlifting was reserved for that class of people, um, that class of people being athletes. As we move through the decades, uh, we started to move away from exercise for fitness um, and performance and moving more towards exercise for health um, and moving that direction slowly such that until the 2008 guidelines came out, um, which were issued from the Department of Health and Human Services based on international expert consensus roundtable, that they concluded that, yeah, we are supposed to do aerobic activity. That's actually good for us. We have a quantifiable amount we should all achieve. But also, we have enough evidence to tell you that muscle strengthening activity is good. So again, those experts were pooling from the totality of the evidence. It was way skewed towards aerobic activity. Everyone was a runner, liked to run. They liked to do exercise running studies. But you also had some exercise physiologists who, and other researchers who knew that, that lifting caused adaptation and changes. And we saw health benefits, uh, which yielded us to recommend two and a half hours a week of aerobic intensity activity, at least moderate, ideally higher. And then two days a week of progressive strength training for all major muscle groups, ideally two days per week, you can go more. So 2008 is the first time the federal guidelines issued that. And people always focus on the aerobic and they don't remember about the, the forgotten middle child guideline. Um, and even in 2018, when the second round of guidelines were published, that has persisted the, the two days a week. Um, now I'll, I'll promote that those guidelines are issued every 10 years. So the third iteration should be coming soon. And I'm really excited to see what the future holds. I know there has been a lot of interest late um, in the role of muscle strengthening activity, you know, not just for aesthetics, which was historically where we came mm -hmm. from, uh, not just for symptom management, which is where we kind of are, but some research, including some I've led, is showing this for recurrence and even mortality outcomes, which we should all really care about. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, and, and we'll get into that. We, we probably have known for a while we'll, that uh, bone uh, density and uh, prevention of fractures, that it plays a role in yes. that. Um, that probably we've known for since before 2008 or oh, what, for sure. what would you say? Okay. I think that's older than that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk um, a bit about your training. So uh, you went to the University of Wisconsin, Madison, great school, great yep. campus, great city. Um, what was your first uh, declared major uh, when you went there and how, and what did you end up with as a major when you graduated? <laughs> um go badgers i have you can't see it i have a massive like <laughs> wisconsin alumni and i have all my degrees up and i don't care i know i'm in hawkeye territory but like badgers go underground so it's fine um, they probably steal your stuffed bucky badger though don't they i keep that at home oh okay. yeah that's okay. that is not worth risking <laughs> um 
but yeah, so I was um, both, uh, so my sister had gone to college about eight months before I had gone, making me the second person in my family to go to college. Um, and she had gone to Oshkosh, which is in Northeastern Wisconsin. Um, shout out to anybody who went to UW Oshkosh. Um, but I, I bring that up to say that when I got to Wisconsin, like to the campus, not only is it beautiful, it's huge. I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know what I was doing and it took me quite a while to figure it out. My mom loved ER. Um, I can't make that joke to my students. Like they have lost that reference. So when I say like Mark Green and George Clooney was in the show, they're like, <laughs> I got to use Grey's Anatomy. But so anyways, my mom was very obsessed with ER. It was every Thursday night for us. So I assumed I was going to be a physician, right? Like I'm, I'm good at math and science. You become a doctor. That's what you do. So I declared biology because Wisconsin did not have a pre-med um, and pretty quickly figured out that that was not a good career path for me. Um, I was pretty good at STEM, you know, science, engineering, math disciplines. Um, and like the cliche that I was, once I got to campus, the first thing I did was formed a gym crew and started working out with regularity. And that's actually where I found out that there was a kinesiology major or exercise science, human movement, which is where I wound up as, as my final degree. Great. And um, then you went on to get your graduate degree and master's and a PhD ultimately. And um, tell me a bit about your PhD program and in particular your dissertation, what, what you worked on and uh, your paper that uh, led to your current position. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a big guess and check gal. So uh, after so during my undergrad, I, I changed majors a lot because I wasn't sure what was correct for me. Um, and then leading up to the PhD program, I tried working professionally for a year. I did not like that. I had questions I wanted to answer, um, but I wasn't sure if I was ready for a PhD because I saw it as a pretty big commitment. Um, so I got a master's degree in epidemiology and population science. So that allowed me two years of like a research exposure to, to pick a thesis and defend it. And I, I was hooked. So at that point, I pursued the PhD within kines kinesiology, um, but my specialty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison was in physical activity epidemiology. So it's integrating all the concepts of kinesiology, human movement, you had you know motor control and learning, but then applying that to population level assessment of physical activity. So marrying the disciplines and then picking up this really cool skill set of like physical activity at a population level. Um, so again, throughout my training, there's this consistent flipping and flopping, like, well, I can do behavioral interventions. I can, I can show people how to exercise and look at their outcomes, but I can also zoom out and look at the population and, and see who's doing what, um, and why, and some of the barriers. Um, so I, I completed that in 2000, in 2020. And then after that, I decided I, well, I, I knew I wanted to be a professor at that point. So typically you need a postdoc training to hone your skills. Um, and to prove you can thrive in a new environment. Um, so I moved on after my PhD. Right. That's fascinating, the epidemiology piece. And you mentioned in, in our pre-conversation, Dr. Alpa P Patel. Um, and so she's with the American Cancer Society yes. and is doing a lot of great research. Where did your paths cross? Was that at UW? So that was during... So I, I had read her work for years, um, you know, like the cancer prevention studies are like, you know, th these are things that you learn and this is how we get our evidence. Um, but it wasn't until my postdoctoral training, getting involved in some of the larger epidemiologic associations. Um, I think it was at a NCI cancer consortium is when we first met, um, but she was good friends and colleagues with my postdoc mentor. So. Dr. Chuck Matthews. Um, so it's nice to like work those professional networks. Like these people are on first name bases and you're like, oh my gosh, that's Alpha Patel. Yeah. So that's wonderful. And so this, this uh, combination of an understanding of epidemiology yes. and exercise science, and obviously bringing those two together to actually study the impact of exercise science on certain populations. Precisely. And, and and talk a little bit about your PhD dissertation. Yeah. So the benefit of, um, you know, knowing how to get people to exercise in theory, right? Like knowing the physiological adaptations, but then 
pulling on that, ep that observational epidemiology, you quickly learn that most people are not physically active. Most people are not hitting those guidelines. Um, and most of our evidence focuses on are people hitting the aerobic guidelines. So I've kind of alluded to this a lot. Um, not only am I a lifter, which I think makes me rare sometimes, uh, I'm also the middle child. So I have this propensity in research to kind of look for things that have been forgotten. And when we look at, you know, prevalent cancer types, you know, we know the big three for women. We know that it's breast, lung, and colorectal. Those are the three most common sites that women get diagnosed with. But number four is endometrial, the disease of the uterus, the lining of the uterus, and it's the most common gynecologic malignancy. When you zoom out and look at how our five-year survival rates have changed over the last few decades, you know, breast cancer has, has really improved survival and outcomes. Again, people absolutely still, still have bad outcomes from that disease, but on average, we have really focused a lot of our research efforts into detection, screening, and therapeutics for breast cancer in particular. So I wanted to focus on a site that affected a lot of people, but also has not been studied. And endometrial is one of those diseases. So then that's mirroring my two interests. What I, what I proposed to do for my dissertation was, can we get a group of women who have had endometrial cancer, uh, who do not meet the muscle strengthening recommendation, um, can we get them to, to meet that guideline through our behavioral intervention strategies? Can we get them to not only learn this behavior, uh, but do this behavior for 10 weeks? Um, and then we assess the outcomes of that approach. So again, this was just a dissertation to get the degree. Um, and we assumed and we hypothesized that a home-based approach would be feasible for this group of people. Um, and we were way before our time, because again, this was in 2018, before COVID, um, showing like what you can do at home or what are some of the benefits that you might be missing um, from using an in-person approach. And were you looking for outcomes related to recurrence of cancer? or quality of life or um, body measurements, strength, or, or all of those? What, what was your hypothesis? What did you hope to um, demonstrate um, just the feasibility of being able to get these women who weren't used to doing strength training to be able to do it? Or were you looking at what the health benefits would end up being? Both shortly. I mean, our, our primary objective was the feasibility aspect. At that time, home-based approaches were relatively rare, and there are there were valid concerns about safety and then adherence, like will people actually do this in their house? But additionally, we did collect measures related to, to study outcomes. So we know that exercise has multi-system effects. So not only did we assess for patient reported outcomes like anxiety, depression, fatigue, uh, we also did some, some strength measurements uh, to look at total body fitness. So before and after intervention, we didn't see any uh, increases in our negative symptom burden. So after this exercise study, patients did not have more anxiety, they did not have more depression, they did not have more fatigue, uh, which is good, but it's also not surprising, you know, that we shouldn't see exercise harming those patient reported outcomes. But we were able to also see that following this 10 week intervention, not only did these women do a great job of adhering to the program, they saw improvements, we call them clinically meaningful, which means this can translate to real life um, and that it matters, clinically significant improvements in their upper and lower body strength. Great, great. So you proved it was feasible and um, that, that there was a benefit. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. I, you're the expert on this subject. Maybe give us a, a summary of what does the data show that the overall benefits of exercise, and you can either do it together, uh, anaer I mean, aerobic and resistance training, or just exercise in general, or specifically for, for a cancer patient, and maybe break it down to prevention of cancer in someone who's never had cancer, um, improvement of outcomes in someone who has had cancer, or prevention of recurrence, How, however you would like. How would you summarize the data on physical activity as it relates to cancer? Yeah, the relationships are quite similar. There's nuance, but broadly speaking, exercise is associated with cancer prevention, cancer survival, and, and overall quality of life in people who currently have a diagnosis. We see a lot 
so I've talked about the physical activity guidelines for Americans, both the first iteration in 2008 and then the second in 2018. Um, in 2019, there, there were, I guess it was another international expert consensus roundtable that included experts like Dr. Alpa Patel. Uh, but the report in particular was written by Dr. Kristen Campbell, where they synthesized the evidence in particular for cancer survivors. What should they be doing uh, for individuals after their diagnosis? Because people still wanted to know, is it safe? Like, should you be exercising after a diagnosis? Is this a good idea? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, those guidelines are very similar for adults, um, including aerobic activity. We're aiming for 30 minutes a day, ideally five days a week. We are also promoting muscle strengthening activity, ideally for the whole major muscle groups. And then in those guidelines, they issue recommendations for avoiding an activity and trying to spread out that activity. So the, the bottom line is that some is better than none and more is better. In epidemiology, we always call a reference category or, or who are we relating this to? And we always see our riskiest or, or the worst category are those who do nothing. Um, so if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you know, I don't do any aerobic activity, the greatest benefit you'll see or, or to get out of that risky category is to do some, which is better than none. And generally speaking, more is better. Yeah. Um, has there been any study that shows that there is a level at which uh, there's too much physical activity that results in harm as it relates to cancer, either prevention, uh, survival, or, or um, recurrence? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I will say that the data, or like if you look at the broad like evidence base, uh, the recurrence outcomes are one of our uh, lesser studied outcomes. There are fewer data sets that we can pull from. Um, but when we look at a larger population level, which can include adult, adults with cancer, there's a leveling off of the relationship. So generally speaking, we say 150 minutes a week, um, which is that two and a half hours of at least moderate intensity aerobic activity. And when we look across the data, there's a plateau effect where we stop seeing the benefit. Basically, the marginal cost is out weighing the marginal benefit at right around 300 minutes a week. So exceeding that five hours a week of at least moderate intensity activity um, has been shown to have certain risks associated with them. So those individuals have a higher risk of injury um, and, and immune suppression are the two that come to mind. Since we know the role of the immune system in carcinogenesis and, and regulation of tumor proliferation factors, I think it's probably safe to assume that exceeding that super high level could theoretically put someone at risk um, for their cancer specific outcomes. That's great. I'd not and not heard that before. And uh, what about um, uh, strength training? Any um, relationship there between uh, is there a top level that, that if you exceed, you might have a negative influence again on on cancer parameters? Yeah, so the cancer so the this is a great question. Um, so when I say that the cancer recurrence data is limited, the muscle strengthening evidence is even more limited, like just in your general population. So I don't think that there is conclusive evidence to say definitively what is that limit. Um, but again, if I can zoom back and put this in a population health lens, there is an interesting relationship for strength training. You know, we talk of we talk about at least two days per week, which means in any seven seven day period, any muscle group gets worked twice, right? So your your legs get a day and then they get a second day to sort of adapt. But when we look at frequency, right? So is it two days, three days, four days? In that really high category, so people exceeding like five, six, seven days per week, we actually see those similar increases in risk, whether that be for injury um, or those people are no longer achieving the health benefits. So in particular with strength training, this is one of my, my main areas of focus, so I can talk more about this. Uh, muscle strengthening activity has been associated, like alone, like just lifting, um, with lower risk of cancer, lower risk of cardiovascular disease, and even some studies saying that it can help prevent diabetes, uh, which are some of our chronic diseases in the population. Um, 
So again, you, people doing some one or two days per week, maybe even three days per week, we see a very consistent association in those lower, you know, uh, it's a lower risk. But at those really high categories, we see those risks increasing again. Um, so it's why most of our governing bodies don't suggest going as hard as you can, you know, CrossFit seven days a week. Um, there's not evidence that that there could be benefit, which you could assume means risk. Gotcha. And um, is there any uh, data that shows um, there's so many different ways of doing strength training and, and you can probably categorize them better than I. I mean, there's just the, the old fashioned weight room, there's the machines, there's bands, but then there's also, you know, what we used to call calisthenics and, mm -hmm. um, and stairs, et cetera. Is, has there been any attempt to determine which of those various strength strength training methods has better um, outcomes when it comes specifically to the cancer parameters? The answer is no. And this is a great question, right? Because it's this bucket that we, we give, right? Muscle strengthening exercise, that's CrossFit, that's me as a power lifter, that's an Olympic lifter, that's your calisthenic human. You know, we're all in the same bucket. And this is one of the topics I like to talk about because the evidence base is so far behind because it's just frequency per week. So that does not at all capture, you know, sets, reps, volumes, relative intensity, absolute intensity. What is your training status? Have you been doing this for a while? Are you maintaining time under pressure, time under tension? Are you using the principles of overload? You know, since we had such a historical focus on aerobic intensity activity, and arguably that's easier to measure since a lot of our activity comes from steps. We do not have that precision of measurement for any type of muscle strengthening activity. Oftentimes in our epidemiologic studies, it reverts to, did you do it, yes or no? And if you did, how many days a week? So no duration, no specificity of muscle groups. And there is a trade-off, right? There's a cost to asking all of those questions, both in, in, in length of the survey and, and reliability of, of the reports. Um, so no, there's not great data on the cancer outcomes, but it's important to contextualize how limited our measures are, yes. um, mm -hmm. and how much has been, has been missing in the past. Um, let's talk a little bit about practicality and, and, um, let's talk about women. Your, your initial PhD uh, study was endometrial and as, um, you certainly know, and, and many of the audience knows that that's one of the cancers that has a, a correlation with obesity and inactivity sure in general. And, um, as we've talked about with uh, on this, um, program with other speakers, you know, cigarette smoking is still the number one. Uh, modifiable risk uh, factor for causing cancer, but close behind is that triad of inactivity and obesity and too many calories. When you um, so back to talking about women and the relationship with cancer, whether it is um, the three b big ones: uh, breast, um, lung, colorectal. Throw in endometrial in general. Um, there's over time it's getting better but you described you know your first foray into a weight room with organized resistance training and i would say that many individuals especially individuals my age i'm going to be 70 women uh, feeling uncomfortable in sure. some um situations that we call strength training uh, would you just comment a bit on strength training in women in particular and yeah. maybe the science, but also maybe step out of the science and a little bit of uh, based on your practical experience of how do you get women who aren't gym rats and are comfortable in a gym to get a regular strength training program going? Yeah, this is a great question. I am uh, a former and a current gym rat, so I feel like I can like play both uh, <laughs> sides of the aisle. Um, so in terms of research evidence, there's nothing that's, you know, women, uh, women have the effect of estrogen, which can be cardioprotective for a lot of our outcomes. Um, but when we look at women who do do strength training in our epidemiologic investigations, they're getting the exact same benefits in terms of their health outcomes as men. And some studies, including one I've published, has shown that the effect of strength training actually might be stronger in women um, than for men. We'll come back to that. Um, but we know that it's not, it's tough because I think in our society, especially for younger women, there is a, a huge focus on 
our identity and our, our image, right? How does our body look? And that can dictate our value to society. Part of the reason that people exercise is to modify their body appearance. Um, so then you put that in the gym environment where most people have a different aesthetic than your average person who's about to begin a routine. So it, it is very overwhelming um, and it can feel intimidating. There's a whole subgenre of gym shaming that, that can really intimidate people and deter them from trying at all. So it's really important to not just consider the evidence, like the evidence is showing like this is great and, and everyone should do it, but they don't, so why? Right, so that's the gap that my research tries to cross. It's one of the reasons we attempted to do a home-based approach. Um, our, our premise was that the gym environment can be stressful, you know, getting the correct gym attire, driving to the gym, like being concerned about what other people are thinking about you are all barriers to exercise. So what if we start someone, build their, their competence um, and their, their self-efficacy towards a behavior within the safety of their own home so that they can get the basics under their belt. They can start to see some improvements in their strength and functionality. I don't really care about their appearance, um, but sort of fostering that strength from within so that they can transition to a recreational facility um, or another community setting where they're going to feel more confident. Um, I will say since moving, when I moved to Iowa for my postdoc uh, as a woman who lifts, it was really important to find a correct community. Um, and powerlifting gyms are, are relatively rare. I was really lucky to not only find a gym that has excellent equipment, um, but really good people. Because I think people who exercise frequently or often can forget what that that opening was like. What it, What's it like to be the new person in the pool that you, you don't know how to swim, right? Um, Sometimes that intimidation factor is just perceived, but again, a lot of our barriers that are perceived are, are actually reality. Yeah. And um, your uh, experience with uh, this home um, program that you, you did, how did you come up with the exact exercises that you were going to teach them? Did it require equipment? Did you ship them weights or bands or uh, what, what was the program and how did um, you uh, instruct them into in uh, the methods of doing it safely? Yeah, yes, yes, and yes. So um, before I went to grad school, I worked as a personal trainer. Um, and my specialty was working with women who were novices in, in, in lifting. They were like, I should do this for my bone health or, and then I would give them the basics. So coming into research, I had this very practical acumen. But then also that, you know, relies on my kinesiology background to know that if these people are new to the behavior, they have to create new neuromuscular adaptations. For the research study, we had to make sure that this was a safe but effective program. So we we did deliver participants equipment that they could use in their house, very minimal. Uh, we gave them progressive uh, dumbbells and then progressive bands um, so that they could begin at any volume that they wanted, aka lighter band or an easier band, but then they could build from that. It's important to note that when I say single joint exercises, we're talking about things like, you know, a bicep curl while they're sitting, right? We're talking about a single tricep extension and then building from there for a more complicated lift. So maybe an overhead shoulder press. The body adapts differently at different ages of life. So for our study, we're talking about postmenopausal endometrial cancer survivors. So I used my professional background to make sure that we had an appropriate evidence-based program that was utilizing all major muscle groups. Um, and that also was a safe for beginners that we could then build upon. And how did you enroll the patients? Um, uh, I, I just think of um, patients that come through and you know, there's got to be a little bit of cheerleading to get them to sign up. And and was this a randomized perspective study or was it a age adjusted um, a cohort? Um, and uh, what sort of cheerleading and coaching and um, um, uh, incentives to get folks to uh, to agree to do this, participate in the study? Yeah, so this was a it was a prospective randomized trial. Um, and the answer is you need a clinical champion. So for me um, at Wisconsin, I, I had a great team around me. Again, this was for my dissertation. So I, I was often the trainee that was like, hi, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help? <laughs> um, 
but the gynecologic oncology clinic was fantastic. So uh, Dr. Ryan Spencer up there, um, he always wears a bow tie if, if you're from Wisconsin or if you've been up there. Um, and he not only got me involved in the tumor board so I could get FaceTime with the colleagues to be like, hello, I need, I'd like to graduate. Could you please recruit patients? Um, but then also like him speaking to patients and explaining briefly, like, here's the study. Would, would you like her to contact you about it more? And that warm handoff is the key to success. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm here at Iowa, I'm, I'm building that same type of relationship with the clinicians because I, I don't practice medicine, right? Mm -hmm. I use the exercise piece. So I let the experts do what they're good at. And it's that handoff, that partnership where we can rely on the clinician's expertise to get them into the health promotion space. Yes. How many women uh, were enrolled in your study? So that was 40. Okay. Wow. And we randomized 20, 20 to an arm. Uh, so, which is abnormal, admittedly, from a scientific perspective for a feasibility study. But one of the main questions we had is if you're a person who signs up for an exercise study and you're told, no, you know, you're in the control group, right? Which means you don't get the exercise study. Will you drop out? which I think is a scientifically valid concern. Uh, we found the answer was no, they would not drop out, uh, but we did something called a wait list control. So I personally think it's unethical to withhold exercise based on everything we know about the benefits. It's right, because I imagine you're telling the control group, just continue doing what, continue to do what you've always done. Exactly. Don't, don't increase your exercise, don't decrease it. Just do what you would normally do if you weren't on the study. Exactly. But they knew they were on a study that's going to exactly. look at the value of exercise. I'd be tempted to want to exercise. And we did see, so we asked them to wear accelerometers, um, oh, okay. which are like Fitbits that they wear on the wrist, both groups. And we did see that, right? You know, people sign up for an extra study because they're interested in exercise. So there was a little uptick in their, their ambulatory activity, like walking around, which is to be expected. But what we did um, with the waitlist approach for that control group that we said, you know what, live your life, we'll talk to you in 10 weeks, then they got the exercise piece oh, so that they, they could still reap all the benefits. They still got, got the cool gym equipment. Um, and we were using study tablets for communication. So as a thank you, not only for being in our study, but then mm -hmm. also ethically, we know this is good for you. Yeah, wonderful. And um, you know what, I, w I think we're going to open it up some questions. And I know right. we probably have some practical questions as well as theoretical questions. Before we do that, though, is there is there any key point of the relationship be between the positive benefits of exercise as it relates to cancer that we haven't touched on that you would like to elaborate? I think that was a really appropriate warm up. Like it's okay. not only good for your activities of daily living, but we see bigger outcomes associated with exercise yeah. too. And I, I always throw in um, that even if it doesn't change your cure rate, it absolutely is going to improve your quality of life and your uh, sense of joy. And so um, not everything that we recommend um, in terms of preventing cancer or uh, um, that, that proving that is kind of hard, but showing that it improves your quality of life and brings joy into your life is, is, is just unrefutable. Well, and the other piece with the strengthening, like we had women reporting that they could lift up their grandkids easier or like get mm -hmm. up off the floor or a lot of these women were doing squats and they would tell me at the beginning of the study, like, I can't do that. I have a bad back. And then I asked them, how do you sit on the toilet? You know, and, and that's one of the functional movements that we have. You have to carry your groceries in. These, the improvements in strength that, that can come from a simple exercise program have these real translatable effects. You're getting mm -hmm. out of a car easier. You have better communication and organization with your limbs. So you're at a lower risk of falling. Like these things pay big benefits, even if they're not one of the like very clinically, you know, tumor marker type of outcomes. Yes. Great. So we're going to open up the questions here. So we got some, some avid, um, exercisers, if not gym rats in the room with us tonight. That's great. Yeah. So hi Jess, how are you doing tonight? Looking great. Thanks, Thanks. for being with us. Hello. Hi. So, let, let's say I'm a super athlete and I happen to get cancer. 
and I do all the uh, exercise stuff that you talked about. And I come to you to say, you know, how can I, you know, be better in relation to uh, curing my cancer? What else I can do? The person that comes to mind would be like Lance Armstrong, right? Mm -hmm. So he had testicular cancer, and uh, he beat, beat it, and then now he's a post-trans um, cancer person. You know, what should he be doing now being a, a super athlete? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You know, Lance Armstrong has a bit of a uh, controversial past and, and there are pieces to consider with his journey, you know, that could influence things. Um, I will admit that I, most of my work does not center in super athletes um, because most Americans, again, as an epidemiologist, most Americans are very inactive and, and not achieving those physical activity guidelines. Um, what I will say is that we do have those recommendations for, for all cancer survivors. Um, so after an individual gets through their treatment diagnosis, they have that aerobic intensity guideline and they have that muscle strengthening guideline. I think it depends on what the person prefers to do as well. Um, in terms of curing cancer, we want to make sure you're at, well, the curing the cancer, I think can be a controversial topic. We want to make sure the person has the best outcomes possible. So certainly meeting those physical activity recommendations for cancer survivors will statistically probably help their outcomes. It depends a lot on the modality of the activity. It depends on the type of cancer and the treatment received. Unfortunately, a lot of our science is not precise enough yet to tell definitively what that answer is. Because it's a fair question. A lot of people want to know, well, this is exactly what I did. This is what I'm doing. Will it work? And we have evidence to point in the correct direction and say, well, this is what we know. Um, but unfortunately, we're, we're working towards that goal. And, and Jess, how would you bring nutrition into the sub into the conversation? Because I, my experience is that um, when patients um, make the commitment to, they want to make, they want to do as much as they can. They want to live their lives better. They want to have they have this second chance at maybe get, getting it right. So oftentimes it's not just physical activity, but they want to change their diet and eat healthier. Um, is there any concern, um, and, and most people, uh, you know, in Iowa and Wisconsin, uh, tend to be, have some weight they could lose. So you're embarking on a physical activity that's going to consume more calories. You're putting strength training into your life, maybe for the first time. And you're feeling like, oh, boy, I'm just going to go for it and go on a diet as well. How do you uh, gui uh, guide folks about healthy eating and nutrition when you're adding strength training into a lifestyle that hasn't seen it before. Yeah. I refer to a colleague because I, for one, I have the dietary patterns of a toddler. So I am, I definitely try to stay like within the like exercise space. Um, but uh, I rely heavily on the American Cancer Society guidelines for nutrition as well, right? So, so broadly, I'm not a dietitian, nor do I play one on TV. But those guidelines talk about vegetables. They talk about fruits. You know, they talk about whole foods, complete foods. I think with strength training too, an interesting piece, um, more for women, but this applies to everyone, is the protein composition of the diet. If you are looking to lay down new muscle or hypertrophy, uh, or to use hypertrophy to grow the muscles, that takes a lot of anabolism, um, which needs to be supported by one's diet. Um, so absolutely to your point, a lot of us um, could take a close look at our diet. Something that we have seen before is that self-monitoring can be a behavioral intervention. Um, so just having someone do something as simple as a food diary and, and tracking the mm -hmm. macronutrients can be very informative. Yeah. Um how about um, the the role of uh, estrogen? Again, we do, we talked about it a bit in terms of postmenopausal and our um, expectations, or maybe make it a little bit more complicated. Many postmenopausal women that are diagnosed with breast cancer are placed then on anti-estrogen. Mm -hmm. um, any science that talks about the role of anti-estrogens while you're starting strength training or any guidance, any science or any 
pragmatic uh, guide um, advice you would give about uh, a woman who is postmenopausal, has gone through surgery and radiation, and now is embarking on a five or ten year uh, journey with um, uh, an anti-estrogen pill? It's a great question. Um, it's admittedly a little out of my depth because I don't. A lot of our work in health promotion and and in the lab is we are working with people where they are, right? So we have guidelines and and recommendations um, for readiness for exercise. So the American College of Sports Medicine has has um, you know clearance protocols that you can you can complete. Uh, in our studies, we administer the PARQ, the F Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire, and that's about broad you know readiness for activity. In terms of the specificity of the estrogen blockers, I think it depends on what the person would want to do um, or what their goals are. You know, if you're looking, uh, if you're on that therapy and you're, you're looking for a very anabolic goal, um, I wonder if that will, you know, change a person's metabolism or, or inhibit certain processes. Um, that is something I would certainly refer out to for a specialist. Um, Again, it's not that it would be bad, but there's always a consideration that one can make to make sure that we are still getting activity in within the confines of where per a person is or, or what medication they might be on. Yeah. And it may be just that, that they, they can't expect to uh, attain the same results. I mean, commonly there will be changes in um, body fat distribution. There will be changes in metabolism. Uh there'll be some um, water weight gain and all of those things play into body image that plays into um, your desire to, uh, to, to move forward. Um, so I, I, I would imagine that um, the activity is still going to be good. They, they may not get as good of results um, in terms of strength or body shape and aesthetics that they would, but um, in terms of the health benefits, they're still going to be there um, and and going to show um, improvement in outcomes, both in terms of cancer control and also just quality of life. Well, for sure. And then this is also pulling on a bit of, you know, my theoretical training. You know, I don't, I personally don't lift for aesthetic reasons, but I know a lot of people do exercise for those aesthetic goals. What we do find in, in terms of the motivation literature, people who are motivated to exercise simply to, to lose weight or to change their body habitus in some way, those people statistically have the lowest likelihood of maintaining their program. So exercise in, in actually diet, I think, is more effective. Um, exercise is one way that people, you know, they're, they're trying to change their body. So they come to exercise. My goal is to hook them and be like, look at all this other cool stuff that's happening. Like your heart rate's going down and like you can lift your groceries and overhead press a toddler, you know, um, focusing more on those, those health and functional outcomes. Yeah, that's a great point. Other questions? Okay, mine is more personal. So I'm gonna give you Jim Rat here. Jim Rat. And, yes. So I come to this fitness center, there's a pool, there's yoga classes um i do a little weight training two or three times a week Poon, do you want to do you want to share your age uh yeah sure i'm 59 great <laughs> um so i forgot where i was going anyway i'm sorry <laughs> you strength train three days a week you're talking about yoga and pool Yes. So, and I was walking three times a week, like 17 minutes, miles. Nice. And, and at my assessment, that was told I need to do more cardio to get my heart rate up other than Dr. Demon's spin class. And I'm like, so I'm trying it and it's making me exhausted. Mm. My sleep is going down and so it was interesting to hear you say that you don't want to overdo the cardio. Did I hear you right? Yeah, you don't want to do more than five hours of, of, of a week. Is that right? And that's your, your at least moderate intensity. So like right. we couldn't have a conversation like this. Mm -hmm. Yep. And usually I'm moderate and I'm told I need to up it. 
to make it high. Yeah. So there is. Um, so first, thanks for sharing your your journey and for sharing your personal experience. Uh, there's a cool little epi uh, caveat that we very infrequently say. So the evidence base recommends for any person or a person with cancer, we say it's 150 minutes a week. So that's your two and a half hours of moderate intensity. So if you want to be one of those people that does just vigorous intensity, think like HIT or Tabata or like that very high intensity, um, you only have to do 75 minutes a week, which is one and a quarter hours to reap the health benefits. Um, so if you're really crunched for time or if you're writing a grant, you might not have time to get to the gym. We still see that same health benefits for a shorter time and a higher intensity. Now, I don't think that necessarily can address your question about the fatigue, which is a completely valid uh, observation. Um, there are two pieces of advice I would get, or two considerations. The first is that that's a very common finding in our exercise studies, that when we get a person to embark on a new program in within the first month, the fatigue scores go way up. Um, and it's after four to six weeks that we actually see the attenuation and then maintenance where a person's fatigue is actually decreasing below baseline after like two months. So uh, it costs a lot of money to save a lot of money if that makes sense. But then additionally, pulling on my behavioral science, I, I use the, met the metaphor of the dial, that clicking it up slowly over time until the volume is loud enough. I know a lot of, I work with students, so there's a propensity to be like, we're gonna do three hours this week and just go full ham, um, which is not sustainable for older adults um, or for this adult. Um, for it to be sustainable and to reap those benefits, it's totally fine to be increasing periodically. So we can start five minutes more. We can move up to 10 minutes. We can go towards that 15. If you're gonna crank it up to 30, you're gonna blow out the speakers. If you just control your ratchet and increase that, it can help with that fatigue response. Great. You you touched on something that I'd like to ask a follow-up question on, and that's that super intense um, aerobic exercise. So uh, there was an article maybe a year ago or something, and, and it was in the light press, but it was a scientific study on, on just what you said, that perhaps you can get by like with a minute of aerobic. Or I saw it, that. it was something yeah. incredibly short. Uh, if you just like get on that bike and just go till you've got like you can't hardly gasp enough air and you're going to just drop over and that that doing like a one minute super intense is as good as an hour of a medium jog or something like that yeah. what would you say the science is on that super intense like i'm just going to climb uh 10 flights of stairs uh as fast as i can and then take the elevator back down. <laughs> yeah, so I think the science actually supports that. I, I too saw that sensationalized, could one minute a day save your life? Like, okay, great. This will get the people to click on the article. Um, but it, it's rooted in science, right? So when our 2008 guidelines were issued, the first federal guidelines, there was a caveat that physical activity should be accumulated in bouts of at least 10 minutes. So this is old, it's not like this anymore, but what the, the science used to say that you can only count activity that occurred in 10 minute bouts. So if you're like me, maybe you ran for the bus for two minutes, I can't run that far, that's not even funny. But if you do two minutes of intensity, that doesn't count, right? That's how it used to be. Um, but in the last decade, once the, the new guidelines were issued in 2018, they found that, that every minute counts. Uh, so the bout, uh, guideline is no more. So that was just in the 2008 guidelines. So in fact, there could be some evidence for that, that every single minute counts. As an epidemiologist, I will say, we see the it's one of the most consistent relationships in, in science that some is better than none. So you could make the argument um, if you wanted to, I only have two minutes to exercise. Should I do these jumping jacks? I mean, it depends, but we see uh, that it's a pretty linear dose response relationship to a point that some is better than none and generally more is better. Okay, great. Well, we're coming to the end of our hour. I can't believe how fast this goes. Um, any final words of wisdom um, uh, about exercise? Uh, where do you think uh, science is going? What are you, what studies are you looking at? Or is there any particular aspect of um, 
you know, the relationship of pickleball to recurrence of prostate cancer, or I mean, uh, where are we going with exercise and, and what sort of research would you like if you could design a study and just complete it in the next three hours, what, what study would that be? And what would you hope to show? Ooh, um, <laughs> if I could, if I had three hours and unlimited budget, I would come up with the answer for how we could get every patient coverage of a comprehensive exercise program. And how could we use our best evidence-based behavioral science principles to get them to adhere? So I, I know a lot of people are interested in, in like, the outcomes, right? Looking at like, how does X affect Y? How does pickleball influence prostate cancer proliferation? I think we're at the point now where the evidence is strong that we need to be doing this. Everybody needs to be doing this. Every patient needs to be doing this. I don't care if it's pickleball. I don't care if it's CrossFit. I don't care if it's jogging golf. Um, but as an epidemiologist, I'll tell you that most people aren't doing anything. And that terrifies me because this is preventable for both morbidity and mortality as my most recent publication showed, that weightlifting was actually preventative for mortality, weightlifting alone. It used to be that, you know, jocks just lift, like this is saving lives. Not to wow. overstate the, the claim. But I do think my agenda and a lot of my interests are focusing on equity issues and coverage and access, right? Like we have a great job of accessing patients who know mm -hmm. how to get resources for themselves. Um, which everyone here, you're one of those people. And congratulations, you know, you're getting the benefits and you should keep it. But what about everybody else? People who don't believe that exercise is good for you, who don't have the time or they don't think they have the time, um, who can't afford it, who can't afford the opportunity cost. They can't like they can't even find the time in their day. So moving more towards making the standard of care for everybody is where I want to see things go. Great. Great, great words of wisdom. Really appreciate this, Jess. We'll, we'll, probably, we'll need to have you back again for uh, a continuation of this conversation. So I've been talking that. to uh, Dr. Jess uh, Gorzalit, who is uh, Associate Professor at the um, University of Iowa, and her expertise is physical activity and cancer survivorship. So thanks for being our guest. Thanks, everyone, for uh, being with us this evening. If you know someone that would benefit by watching or listening to this program, it will be available on demand tomorrow at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel and at the Mercy Cancer Center website. So please join us again next week. Thanks for coming. Bye, everyone.